Hello and welcome to our latest digital course for the Isle of Axholme and Hatfield Chase Landscape Partnership about documentary research. Now, before we get started, whilst it's not essential, in order to get the most out of this online course, we do recommend that you have the following to hand, a pen and some paper. Now, this is just so you can make notes as we go through. Um, if you don't feel like making notes, you don't have to. There's not going to be a test at this or anything. Um, but if you do just want to be making notes, I do recommend you have them to hand before we get going. Now, this being digital, you can, of course, pause this course at any time. Um, and if you need to, I do recommend that you do. However, there will be a suggested break point halfway through. And I do recommend that you take a break at that point, just to step away from the screen, um, have a drink, just go for a wander about the room at the very least, um, just to help your focus and your concentration as we continue on through. Now, the aims for this course. This course aims to show you how to use different types of documentary evidence to investigate the history, heritage and archaeology of an area. At the end of this course, you should know where to look to find information about a settlement or site. You should feel confident about researching an area and you should know where to look online to find reliable sources. Before we really get started, though, I do think it is important for you to know where this course has come from. So we're going to do a quick overview of the project. Now, this course is part of the Isle of Axome and Hatfield Chase Landscape Partnership. This is a huge project that is being run through North Lincolnshire Council and is being funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund. This project is so big, it is then subdivided into 16 different projects. We are running one of those 16 projects, Presenting the Past. Now, Presenting the Past is focused on three different parishes in the Isle of Axone. That's Belton Parish, Oston Ferry and Haxey. And the purpose of our um, of our project of presenting the past is to work with people who are living and working in those communities to help them to engage with the history and heritage of where they live. So we started by going to um, the village halls, having open meetings and letting people tell us what they had questions about, what skills they wanted to learn. And we use that to design the programme. And as part of that work, we identified that quite a few people wanted to know how to research their local areas, but did not feel they currently had the skills to do so. And that is how this course was born. Now, Presenting the Past has, um, is being run by a charity called Heritage Lincolnshire. Now, Heritage Lincolnshire is a charity that works to conserve the heritage of the county. We deliver activities for people to learn about it, to gain new skills and to get practically involved. We believe our work makes Lincolnshire a better place to work and visit and that our cultural activities help to enrich people's lives. So if you ever attended um, Heritage Open Days in Lincolnshire, we help to um, run them. We have our own commercial archaeology unit um, who get on site and do research out in the field. We run courses, we train people, we run community excavations, and we always have a building project when we're helping to restore an old and important building in Lincolnshire um, and bring it back into use by the community. We are just coming to the end of one of our current projects in that regard, the Old King's Head, which is near Boston. And this Tudor Coaching Inn will be accepting guests again very, very soon, which is very exciting. If you want to find anything more about Heritage Lincolnshire, I really recommend that you just Google us, type in Heritage Lincolnshire to Google and you'll find our website very, very quickly. And you'll be able to see about all the work that we're doing. You can see how you can support what we're doing and how you can get involved. You can now also become a member, which has huge benefits for you and your family. 
And the last introduction is, of course, who am I? So my name is Lydia Hendry. I'm a community archaeologist with Heritage Lincolnshire. I will uh, be honest at this point, I do not actually come from Lincolnshire myself. Um, and actually, this has made doing presenting in the past and working in the Isle of Axe home even more exciting for me because I've been able to investigate and discover this fascinating heritage for the first time. And that really has been a, an important and special opportunity for me because it shows that with a little research, how many stories can um, can be revealed. And I'm looking forward to showing you through this course how you can achieve that yourself. And so let's get started. I'm going to start with a little quote by Samuel Johnson, of course, the famous man who wrote the dictionary. So he has a quote attributed to him, which says there is a knowledge of two kinds. Either we have the knowledge when we know a subject ourselves, or we have the knowledge of where we can find information on it. And this is a really, really important point. No one is ever going to know everything about the history or heritage of an area. The important thing is the actual skill to find that knowledge for yourself and to research it yourself and to know where to go next when you have a question. Because once you have that skill, then you are unstoppable in tracking down these stories. So just have a think, what resources do you know of already? Um, you could write some answers down on your paper if you're making notes, but some options might be a lot of you will be using, for example, Google Maps if you're just looking at what's in an area. Now, of course, Google Maps will show us the current businesses that are around us, where the fish and chip shop is and what opening times it has. But Google Maps can also be used to show history, heritage and archaeology. So many of the resources we're going to be looking at might not be as new to you as you suspected. Now, before I launch into telling you about all these different uh, resources that you can use, I do want to take a moment to talk about information because the amount of information that is available to us these days means it can sometimes be overwhelming and we need to make sure that we are discerning properly what information we should be using and what information we should be a little bit more cautious of. A good example of what I'm talking about is think of the magazine section in your local shop. Um, now, if you close your eyes and reach out and grab a magazine, you are just as likely to get a magazine about the local celebrity gossip, the recent celebrity gossip, as you are to get um, a magazine that's detailed about gardening. Now, if you approach the internet and uh, documentary research in the same way, you are just as likely to be getting information that is more gossipy, it's been passed down um, through Chinese whispers, it's perhaps not quite as reliable as you are to be getting a respected and researched journal. And so you need to be able to tell the difference. Um, and you need to be able to judge for yourself how accurate, reliable and how valuable a source on the internet is. Remember that unlike a lot of other sources, such as books, research papers, no one has to approve information that is on the internet. Anyone can write content and anyone can read it. So you just need to be aware that it is your job as the searcher, as the reader, to evaluate what you're reading and determine whether it is relevant to you. Now, there are two main source types that you're probably going to be using when undertaking your own documentary research. We divide these into primary sources and secondary sources. Now, primary sources are sources that are written directly from fact or directly by the person experiencing the event. So, for example, a primary source could be government documents or statistics. You've got historical or legal documents. Eyewitness accounts are regarded as primary sources. Experiment results, audio or video records. Photographs are also a primary source. It doesn't have to be text. 
speeches and interviews, they're both primary sources, surveys, field work, even diaries are considered a primary source. Think of Anne Frank's diary and the knowledge that has given people about what it was like to live during that time period and the different pressures that had on a very ordinary girl at the time. Scholarly articles sometimes sit in between these as well. It depends um, how much they're relying on fact and how much they're relying on interpretation. Now, secondary sources are when someone has taken a primary source and have interpreted it into their own publication. So, for example, a newspaper article is a secondary source because they are reporting upon a fact and then doing their own interpretation as to the event. Magazine articles are the same. Books, often people bring together lots of these different uh, pieces of evidence and brings them to make an argument or to present a case. The same goes for scholarly reports. So these are considered secondary because they are second to the fact. Both of these are important when you're doing research, but it is also important to know the difference. When you're looking at a secondary source, you are also dealing with somebody else's interpretation. And sometimes this is really valuable, but sometimes this can be led, uh, lead you down biased routes as well. Now, once you have got to your source, you then need to be able to look at it yourself and identify how you're going to use it, if you're going to use it at all. Now, a good way of breaking this down is to use the CARS checklist. Now, this is a way that you can use to check if a source is credible, accurate, reasonable and supported. Now, I will be open with you. There are very, very few sources that are going to meet every single one of these criteria. But if you learn to use the criteria and look at them and um, regard each source with these in mind, you'll be more likely to be able to separate the high quality information from the poor quality information. So first of all, let's have a look at credible. So this is asking whether a source is Now, to identify if a source is credible, you need to ask yourself a few different questions, such as who is the author? So if you research the author and find that they are a respected um, member of the field, for example, if you are looking at an archaeological report and you look at the author and find they've been working in archaeology with a ver you know, various respected companies for 20 years plus, that is a credible author. You know they have the experience and um, the knowledge behind what they are saying. Whereas if the author is someone who has um, only been doing this job for a year or two, they don't actually have a job, perhaps this is more a hobby for them, you want to be a little bit more careful. Of course, you will have people out there who are incredibly knowledgeable and they've never been employed in a profession, but you just need to be a little bit more aware that there is a chance that they're not going to be as credible in what they're writing. If you're looking at a book, it's always worth just to have a quick look at the reviews. If the reviews are from newspapers such as The Guardian and The Times, and they're talking about how it's an accurate and well-researched um, piece of work, then you know it's probably going to be credible. If you can't find reviews or the only review you can find is from this person's mum, once again, you're going to be questioning a little bit what's going on there. And then is the spelling and grammar correct? Now, this is like when you're looking at that rather suspicious looking email that comes into your inbox and you notice that they've spelt the name of your bank wrong and a few different things that just flag up in your mind that this might be a scam. It's similar when you're looking at sources. So is the spelling and grammar correct? Now, of course, all scholarly reports and I think probably all uh, journal articles they will have the occasional spelling mistake. That isn't something to worry about hugely. But consistent spelling mistakes means that this has not been proofread. It hasn't been proofread perhaps by the person who wrote it or by a peer in the field. And that once again suggests that it might not be as credible as you were hoping. The next thing to look at is accuracy. So when was it written? 
now with very, very um, kind of scholarly articles. You can use sources that go back a few years, but remember that a, a field as uh, area of study is constantly changing. And so if you're using sources from a good 20, 30, 40 years ago, things have changed since then. And our knowledge, our understanding of an area has changed since then. So you don't want to be using out of date information. Accuracy also looks at, does it show both sides of the argument? Now, this is actually really important. Um, if you are looking at, for example, a propaganda leaflet, so something your political party has written, it's showing one side of the argument. They are arguing why you should vote for them or why you shouldn't vote for somebody else. They are not going to be doing an overall review of policies and what's been happening in your local area and how different ways, how different uh, methodologies could, um, could challenge or change that. When you're doing research, you want to be looking at both sides of the argument even if it's something you disagree with. When someone shows they have examined both sides of the argument, it shows that they have explored all different avenues um, of research and therefore are coming to a more balanced, a more comprehensive review of the field. And then we want to look at if something is reasonable. Here we go. And this is perhaps mainly looking at, is this source biased? So is the language factual or emotional? When you're doing research, we are really after factual language, not emotional. Emotional language might be talking more about the beauty of the place or the travesty that this building is being torn down. It's very much trying to make you feel something rather than trying to explain why you should support this argument. We are after facts when we're doing research. Does the author provide evidence? This is also really important. If you're reading an article about an archaeological site near you and this author offers no evidence for their claims, then you actually have no reason to believe what they're saying. If they say that that lump in the ground is an Iron Age hill fort, well, what evidence for that is there? Where are the sources they're linking to? Where's the archaeological reports they're linking to? What evidence is there for their claims? And if they offer none, then it perhaps isn't a reasonable uh, source. And then also, is there a conflict of interest? And this comes back to researching the author again. So if you um, are looking at a report that is looking at the history and heritage of an old building in your area. Now, if the person who is writing this report is being employed by the company who wants to tear it down and build a block of flats, that person has a conflict of interest. They may be downplaying some of the more important events that happen there, so they can argue this isn't a hugely significant building, so we can tear it down. Or it could go the other way. If it's being written by someone who doesn't want a building torn down, who perhaps are on a member of a local um, history group, they might be perhaps embellishing some of the facts, whether consciously or not, or subconsciously. Sometimes, of course, you don't realise you are slightly, um, slightly inflating the evidence, perhaps. Um, they are going to be writing a biased report. Now, the thing to remember here is everyone is biased. We all have our thoughts and beliefs that will influence how we interpret evidence. The main ones to watch out for are for major conflicts of interest, where people are being employed by a certain company or they're being paid money by a certain um, side or argument to write the report. And then supported. And this is going back to providing evidence, really. Um, so is the evidence referenced? So someone could say, for example, going back to our Iron Age hill fort, um, there is evidence for this as an Iron Age hill fort. We want to see that reference. We want to see them saying, this is where I got that information from. And then you can go to that information, perhaps that archaeological report from 10 years ago, and you can find that online and check that for yourself and go through this whole cars checklist again. If a book, for example, 
is referencing lots and lots of pieces of evidence and you're following up those pieces of evidence and they are all ticking lots of boxes in the CARS checklist, then you can go, yes, this book has been well researched. You do have it sometimes get books or reports that are referencing lots of different articles, so they sound good. But once you follow them up, you find that they're referencing Wikipedia or um, random places on the internet and you read them, you start to go, this isn't evidence, this isn't researched. So although the person writing the book has put in references, those are not um, reasonable, they are not accurate, they're not credible sources themselves. And so that throws the article itself into question. I hope that makes sense. Sometimes if you're struggling with this, it might be an idea to find a fact book you perhaps have on the shelf or an article online and just go through this checklist and actually work through it. And by working through it, you'll be able to see how all these different questions can be answered. So if you want to pause here and just explore the CARS principle further, please do. And we will join you, of course, again, when you choose to start this course up. And the last thing I want to um, just quickly discuss before we get on to good resources for heritage research is approach research with the right attitude. Now, a lot of people actually fall into this trap. The best way to avoid uh, biasing yourself too much is to give yourself a good question and also helps to focus your research. So, for example, if I wanted to research my local village, my research question would be what stories, sites, uh, artifacts have been found in a one mile radius of my house? That gives me a really good focus area to look at and leaves me open to see reading lots of different stories, lots of different things. However, if my research question was the Romans were the biggest influence on my area and I want to find out why, that's perhaps a little bit more biased because I'm going to be biasing my mindset to only looking at the Roman evidence because that's what I'm trying to research. But in my whole question of the Romans being the biggest influence on my landscape, I am then ignoring all the other time frames and all the other pieces of evidence that might argue against that. And so I'm not actually looking at the full picture. So approach research with the right attitude. Be prepared to read things that disagree with your own point of view and actually take them on board, research them because it's never easy when you decide to prove yourself wrong, but um, sometimes and often it will mean that you are producing much better research and you are creating much more accurate and interesting stories. Okie dokie, so now that we've explored how to look at evidence, we're going to explore which sources I particularly recommend for doing heritage research and documentary research. A lot of these are going to be looking at online sources because of course those are the ones that we have mainly been able to access in the last year with everything that's been going on but I will briefly look at some um, archival resources as well. Now, this is also our midway break point. Um, the second half is slightly longer in this course, uh, but if you do want to have a break, I do recommend now to have a stop, step away from the screen and just uh, loosen up again before coming back on. And I will, um, I will continue on in a moment once you are ready to get started. Okay, let's get started with good resources for heritage research. Now, if you're researching an area, a town, a village, I find the best place to start is to start with the name. Now, there are a few different dictionaries around now, but a dictionary of place names is actually a fascinating book and I could almost flick through it for fun, to be perfectly honest, because I'm that sort of person. But a dictionary of place names 
tell you where place names come from. And that tells you about a place itself. So, for example, if you have a look at Oston Ferry, I had a look at this in a dictionary of place names. And this was the entry underneath it. So Oston Ferry was founded during the Saxon period when it was two separate settlements, the farmstead of Oston and the ferry port of Kinnard's Ferry. The name Kinnard's Ferry possibly derives from King Edward's Ferry. And this refers to Edward the Confessor, who reigned from 1042 to 1066. And the name Oston comes from the Old Norse Ostertun, meaning East Farmland. The ferry was a key area in the landscape, being one of the few places where access to the Isle of Axon could be gained. Now you'll see here that the place name entry is really focusing in on the name of Oston Ferry and how it came about. And from that, we've learned many things. First of all, Oston and Ferry refers to two separate settlements. That settlement has today joined together to create Oston Ferry. Oston means East farmland. So we know that people have been farming here. That's particularly important um, as it is an agricultural landscape. And as it's Norse, we can assume that they were farming here in the Anglo-Saxon Viking period. The ferry really refers to how important the ferry was in the landscape. And so we know that people were crossing the river here and that the river was indeed here at the time. It was still a really, really powerful influence in the landscape. And so just by looking at the dictionary of place names, we already know what's going on here and kind of in what time frames as well. So a really good place to start. This is the other area that I would start when researching any small settlement, the Doomsday Book. Now, many of you probably have heard of the Doomsday Book. It is, of course, a very, very famous document. It was commissioned by King William as a way of understanding this new land that he had conquered. Now, this isn't just an inaccessible book in the um, libraries in London that we cannot see and can't really understand anymore. It has been fully digitised, but also fully digitised into a usable resource online. So we're going to have a quick look at it now. There we go. So when you go on to Open Doomsday, you can see the address at the top there. This is the image that might well greet you. Now you can either search by place, person, or you can search on the map. Now, for example, I'm going to have a look at Belton. That's, of course, one of the other um, areas that we're looking at. The first thing to be aware of is, of course, many places in this country have a place name that can be found elsewhere. So make sure you pick the right one. Now, of course, we know we're not in Suffolk and there are actually two Beltons in Lincolnshire. So we'll click on that one. And yes, that's the right one. It's confirming it for me on the map. And it says it's in the 100 of Epworth. And I know that Epworth is near the Belton we're looking at. So yes, this is the right Belton. The other Belton is down this way. No, nope, it's more, more down there. Now, this will show us a few different things. So first of all, we've got the entry, the page where Belton is found in the Doomsday Book, but it also interprets that information for us. So you'll see here, Belton was a settlement in the Doomsday Book. Well, first of all, that tells us that Belton, the village, was around in 1066. So that tells us something of the history of the area. In the hundred of Epworth and the county of Lincolnshire. It had a recorded population of 75 households in 1086, putting it in the largest 20% of settlements recorded in Doomsday. Now that might be surprising. Belton is a village at the moment, it's not a town, it's not a city, and yet it's in 1066, it was in the, in 10, sorry, 86, it was in the largest 20% of settlements. So this is very, very accurate information. We can even tell you how many households were living there. 
almost a thousand years ago. Now we'll just scroll down and this explains the information a bit more. So this land in Belton was owned by two people, King William and Geoffrey of Laguresh. And this tells us what they owned and also how that changed. So we can see the owners of this section here is quite interesting. Lord in 1066 at the time of the conquest, Queen Edith. A mere 20 years later, King William's taken the land for himself. Coming down here, we'll also see that it gives more detailed information. So the households belonging to King William, 18 free men, 14 smallholders. Now, if you have any doubt as to what these terms mean, you can click on the question mark just above it, and it will bring up some more information for you. And that tells us that villages and freemen, they were around 40% of households, small scale landowners, owning on average 30 acres of land and two oxen for ploughing. So that will just give you a bit more information to what you're reading. And the same goes for the land and resources. So ploughlands, it tells you exactly what that is there and a bit more information. And there is a link to learn more as well. You can also, as well as searching by place, search by person. So let's have a look at Queen Edith. So there is a really, really interesting story here. So this landowner is associated with 238 places before the conquest and none after the conquest. So we know that she was a queen who was living in this area before, before the conquest and did not fare too well afterwards. And of course, we can find that out by reading other resources as well. But it's just an illustration to show how the Doomsday Book can also show how individuals' fortunes changed throughout the conquest. So that is the Doomsday Book, a really interesting resource. Even if you just want to look at your local village or town where you grew up, it shows you how that place was a thousand years ago. So once you've got started, we are then going to start looking at resources for researching different things. We're going to be looking at researching archeological sites, artifacts, and standing heritage. So let's start with researching archaeological sites. Now, if your archaeological site has remained visible on the surface still, aerial photographs can be a really, really useful tool. So this is when we are looking down from the sky and you can see shapes in the ground. And this will give you a different view to how you see it from the ground level. And there you go. You can see all the shapes there. Now, this is actually Bolingbroke Castle, which is, of course, um, a bit further south than the Isle of Axone, But it is such a beautiful example of what can be seen um, that I had to include the picture. Now there's three different options um, of perhaps the most commonly used resources for aerial photography. However, I will admit the number one one I always use is Google Maps. Um, I very rarely use these two, but we will have a look at them anyway. So the Cambridge University website. Now this is a collection of aerial photos that can be accessed freely online. Once again, you can see the link up there. I'm quite visual, so I do like using maps to search. And that just gives you a show of where all the photos currently are. And let's move up slightly. A little bit further again, We're almost at the Isle of Axe. There we go. So we've got I'll max them up here. There we go. So there are two different colours of pin, as you can see. We've got the brownie orange pin and we've got the blue pins. And let's just have a look. This one's in Epworth. 
you can then click on the link there. Uh, clearly it's not working today. And let's just do a little bit of a, there we go, that's a bit better. So as you can see there, I have just clicked show locations with thumbnails only, and I'm hoping those are going to be the ones that have the links properly put in. There we go. So here you go, you've got a lovely aerial shot here. This was taken in 1984 and shows a beautiful layout of the land. You can see all the farms there. And what you're looking for when you're looking at aerial photographs is often either if you're interested in buildings and the development of a village, you'll be looking at the shape of the village and um, comparing that to how it has changed today. Or if, like me, you're more interested in your archaeological features, you'll be actually looking in the fields because crops actually change how they grow dependent on the ground beneath them. So if there is lots of archaeological ruins and stone, they're going to grow differently to if there are old ditches beneath them. And this creates shapes when we look at them from the sky. So we've got, I think that's not quite something there. But we've got a vague round impression over here that might be worth looking at perhaps on a different site to see if we can find that pattern again um, but i can't see too many other things on this image there we go another one to look at is britain from above another completely freely accessible site and we'll have a look at the map. And there we go. And once again, you can search by area. To find the area that you want to look at. I think we need to go a bit further in again. Now, of course, with both this site and the previous one, we are dependent on just simply where the photographs are slightly. Um, the benefit of using Google Maps, which we'll have a look at in a moment, is of course that we can move the map around exactly to where we want it because everywhere has been photographed. There we go. So once again, near Epworth, got two results coming up. Is is it going to let me click it? There we go, right. And then we can show you what's going on here. And there we go. So this is actually looking at Haxi, another one of our target areas. And this little icon up here is just telling you that it was taken from a plane. So you can see it's not looking directly down like Google Maps does. It's looking across the landscape. But once again, we can have a look, see if we can see any features in the ground that are worth further consideration. And this might show up these archaeological sites. I'm not seeing anything in this one. However, that's not to say they're not there. That, of course, brings us to Google Maps. Now, like I said before, this is my personal favourite when it comes to using aerial photography. Now, for the example for this one, I am going to be using Oston Ferry because there are some very, very interesting um, earthworks in that region. But if you fancy just having a poodle around on it, just pop in uh, near where you live and zoom in nice and close and of course what you'll see is the settlement where you live and 
all of the fields surrounding it. And it's in the fields that we're really, really looking for these patterns. Now, if we just go up here to Melwood. Now I'm cheating slightly here, of course, because I know what I'm looking for. Um, it works both ways. If you've got an area you're interested in, you can um, have a look at it closer or you can just have a look around and see what catches your eye. There we are. And you can see in this area, there are actually lots of shapes. And the more you look, the more you're going to see. So starting down here, we've got that nice long stripe, some sort of a structure happening there by the looks of it. And of course, over here, we've got a lot more going on as well. Lovely cross happening here. And that looks like an old footway or footpath happening up there. Lots and lots of happening is happening here. Now, this is actually uh, close to the location of Low Melwood Priory. So we know, we know there's archaeology here. It's a bit of a given. We've got another lovely one coming down there as well. So also, the more you look, the more you do start to see. So if you have an archaeological site that you want to research, Getting a look at it can give you a really good clue of what you're looking at. You can see the shape of it and um, you can see how it fits within the landscape if it's connected to any existing buildings. Um, it does show you what's going on a bit more. So that's also a really good tool in researching an archaeological site. Now, what about if you have an artifact? Now, you could either once again have an artifact or you want to see if any artifacts have been found near you almost as a starting point. Well, once again, you have a, a number of uh, different resources available to you freely online. Now, we're going to start with the British Museum. It's a long way away from the Isle of Axum, I know, but of course, the British Museum has a fantastic collection of all different artefacts. Now, you'll have already come across a couple of these if you have um, been on my digital archaeology on the Isle course and you may recognize some of them but let's type in let's try Haxi for a change there we go so you can see we've got lots and lots of images I think they are still in the process of digitizing their full collection but of course they're getting closer all the time and you've got an image, you've got a date, and you've got where it was found acquired. And of course, we have searched by location. And what we can see immediately is that a lot of Bronze Age pal staves, socketed, socketed axes have been found in the area. One token, and of course, they haven't got the uh, image for that one. So one spearhead, which they haven't got the image for, and a token. And this is actually the one that I look at a bit closer in the archaeology on the Isle course. But let's have a look at it now. And so if you use the British Museum website, you will get a good high quality image of the artefact you're looking at. And then down this side, you've got the object type, museum number. So that's how the museum identifies uh, its millions of artefacts that it has and a little bit more information about it. So there we go, issue up Anthony Barnby. And much like the Open Doomsday, they have made this a really easy website to use because um, they have included links. So down here, it has a bibliographic reference. So this is actually going back to what I was saying about cars. Is it referenced? So here they're saying, if you want to find out more information, You've got a, uh, an article here, trade tokens issued in the 17th century, so you can find out more about it. You'll notice it was written quite a long time ago, but um, this is clearly the reference book that is still the one that is being used today. There we go. And so if you wanted to, you could try taking that reference to your local library and see if they have that book, or of course they can get it in for you and your research can continue from there. There we go. And then if you click on one of these links, for example, Anthony Barnby, that will give you more information about him. So it can tell you his address was in Haxie, Humberside, North Lincolnshire. 
and there's a bit more information about him there. So it really is a very well thought out website, this, and very easily put together. The other one, which is a bit more of a local um, database, is links to the past. Of course, playing on Lincolnshire's name there. Now, this one is a fantastic resource of local artifacts. We'll try typing in Haxi again, see what comes up. There we go. And we are going to come back to links to the past a little bit because this is actually a really good website if you're going to the archives in Lincoln. For example, if you want to have a look at the parish records in Haxi, that's telling us that's one of the results for the area. You won't be able to read this online. Um, so you'll see this is all that comes up, repository Lincolnshire archives. So all you need to do is book a slot at the Lincolnshire archives and you'll be able to read this record. So if you were doing lots of research about Haxi, of course, you can use this site to quickly and easily identify lots of different resources. And this will give you the, um, the place to go if you want to examine them further. And like you can see in all of these examples here, it is probably going to be sending you to the Lincolnshire archives. Now, the Portable Antiquity Scheme database is an absolutely brilliant resource, really, really fantastic project. Now, this is actually also run out of the British Museum, but it is not um, a catalogue of things that are currently in the British Museum, but a catalogue of items that have been found by the public. So um, people who are doing metal detecting uh, work or hobbies, um, if you're walking in the field, if you um, happen to be working in a field, if you're a farmer, if you find an artefact in the ground, you can go to your local finds liaison officer for the Isle of Axome. I think they're based in Scunthorpe Museum and they can record your artefact and then return it to you. And once recorded, it goes onto this database, which is freely accessible. Um, however, it will not show you the exact location of finds, just in case um, it is, of course, on private land. They don't want people flocking there uh, to try and find more artefacts. Um, let's let's try Belton. We've not done Belton for a while. We'll make sure we get the right Belton. OK. So you can see lots and lots and lots of records. We want to make sure we've got North Lincolnshire because we've got the other Belton um, in the south. I've just gone past it, I think. There we go, County of Origin. We're just going to click North Lincolnshire to make sure we have the right area. And so this is a list of all the different artifacts that um, have been found in Belton. And you'll see, as I was saying here, it says the data is recorded but publicly available. Um, this fine spot is only known as Belton because the grid reference and parish are protected. So this just gives you an idea of things found in the area. So going down, if you live in Belton, you might be surprised that actually so much has been found. There you go. And there is a good um, description for each one. So let's have a look at this one. So dressed hook from the post medieval period. You have a really close, uh, well taken image there, and you have more information about it if you click on this link. So it gives you a brief description. It goes through the chronology, the dimensions and weight, discovery dates. Of course, that one's found um, almost 10 years ago now. And what this is doing is it is creating a huge database so we can see what is being found where. There you go, at the bottom it also brings up similar objects. So if we find a tight concentration on one of their database maps, where, for example, a lot of Viking artifacts are being found, that might be flagged as an area for future research as being a, a possible Viking settlement or important in the Viking period. So we can see some very, very interesting patterns beginning here. Now, if you prefer to, um, to look 
on a map, you do have that option as well, but of course you're not going to see the exact locations where things were discovered. So if you want to just find out what has been found in your area to help tell a narrative perhaps um, of your town, your village, um, this is a really, really great resource to have. And of course, once you've got those artifacts, you can complete further research upon them to discover more about them. And then the last one is perhaps I don't use so often, um, National Trust Collections. This is just another good repository of um, artifacts. And it is all the artifacts that are found in the National Trust, basically, that are owned by the National Trust. Now, of course, this is only really going to be relevant if you have a National Trust collection um, within your search area or if you're looking for a particular type of artifact to do more research on that it might be worth checking then so once again i've searched by area i've just searched by lincolnshire because this is just an example and it's bringing up with all the artifacts held in or connected to lincolnshire and that's twenty one thousand. so you can of course use the explore and refine your search you can explore by place category so for example if I want specifically to find archaeological material I can refine and of course that's now only bringing up one result so um, archaeological material date unknown and that's all the information I'm going to get on it so it is of limited um, limited use this one and so I don't tend to use it as often, but it is worth mentioning just in case you have a National Trust property in your area. The third area we're going to be looking at is resources for researching standing buildings. Now, Lincolnshire is littered with fascinating historic buildings. And if you're curious about them, it is easy to find more about them. Now, if I was walking along and I saw a building I was interested in, these are the first places I would start to look. Now, the National Heritage List for England. Ah, clearly my link is out of date. OK, so if you type in English Heritage. listed buildings it's fairly easy to find they are search the list even a broken link can't stop us okie dokie now historic england keep a list of all the listed buildings um, in the country and so they also list uh, scheduled monuments, protected wrecks, registered parks and gardens and battlefields. So this is a really, really useful resource. Now you can of course search by keyword, postcode, list entry number, but I am personally going to try searching by map just because I work um, a little bit more visually and I find that is easier for me to work with. There we go. I think it is the turn of Oston Ferry. We'll have a look there. Oston Ferry, North Lincolnshire. So we'll just come up with a clarification there. And it brings up a map of the area. If my internet will allow it. There we go. And we're coming quite close, so I'm just going to scroll out slightly. And there we go, it's just loaded it all now. So it has a key. Um, each of these blue triangles is a listed building. And if you hover your mouse over it uh, correctly, information and link to more information will pop up. And then this red area here, that is um, 
a scheduled monument, and that is actually Oston Castle there. So there you go, click on it. View list entry, and that brings you straight to more information about it. There we go, so location, reasons for designation, details, there is a lot of information on this website and you get a similar level of detail for pretty much most entry, most entries now. Um, some entries also have recently taken photographs of them. Uh, they have been, the Historic England have been running a campaign to get people to contribute their own photos um, of sites and this is uploaded onto the website a campaign called Enrich the List. Let's have a look at this one. So arms houses, view list entry. There we go. And once again, you have all the details coming down there. So this is a really, really great resource if you're researching any sort of standing building. Um, if it is listed or scheduled in any way, um, this is the one to look at. So you can see these are arms houses and lovely piece of information here. Francis Sanders dedicated these houses to Almighty God forever, AD 1860, for the benefit of aged females. Um, a, a flattering uh, description of people, I'm sure, but it tells you why these houses were built, who they were being used for. And here we go, Francis Sanders, a local benefactor. And it also tells you about other things he was doing in the area. So, so many stories are being uncovered just by researching an interesting standing building that you saw. The Heritage at Risk Register is, is also hosted by English Heritage, so much of the information is the same. As is England's Places. So I only tend to use the main list, um, the English Heritage listed list. Now this one perhaps isn't so much standing buildings, but it does show how places change over time. And I do think it's important to have a look at. This is another absolutely brilliant free resource. So the National Library of Scotland, don't be confused by the title. It covers the whole of England as well. Now, if we click on Map Finder with Outlines, this is going to show us quite an unusual view of the UK. It is going to be a version of the UK covered in squares. So let's get closer. Now, each one of these uh, boxes is a map. And these are the historic maps that have been made at different points. Now then we just need to find the Isle of Axon. Oh, must be close now, getting there. There we go. So for example, let's have a let's have another look at Belton. If you click on a map, you'll see it turns blue. So it shows you that's the one you're looking at. And to the side, it will bring up your results. So it's telling me that I have three maps available for this area. And if you have a look, each of those maps will be for a different date. So we have a map from 1885, 1905 and 1950. So let's have a look at the oldest map to begin with. There you are, and there you go. It's brought you up with the lovely map. All of that, so see belt off there. Belton is over here. And uh, that's what you've got to go on. Now you can order these maps. Um, they're relatively cheap, not too expensive at all. Um, you can also though do a print of a PDF. Now, Let's just zoom in quickly. There is a feature 
on uh, the National Library of Scotland to get two maps of different dates and overlay them on top of each other. There you go, so garden plantation. There you go, it's not letting me go down for some reason. There we go. Right, so there we go. You've got the uh, All Saints Church still here today. And of course the Crown Inn still here today as well. And then if you look at a modern map of Belton, you'll see that this area has become much more housed around here and along this side there. So you can see how they just started out. Now, as I say, National Library of Scotland has a facility where you can overlay two maps of different periods. So you can see these changes. So you'll be able to see on the other map all these other houses, for example. However, I actually don't recommend that you use it. If you're really researching the development of a settlement or a village, I want to see how the buildings changed and moved about and which ones stayed the same. Um, I almost find that the National Library of Scotland has made it too easy. And when it's too easy, you don't see everything that could be seen. What I recommend is you take the two maps you're interested in and do print PDF. And then, I would get you to take, for example, starting at the oldest or the most recent, I normally start at the oldest, is you get a piece of tracing paper and trace over all the area you're interested in. So I would be tracing, tracing over these roads. I would be definitely drawing in all these buildings here, all these field boundaries. And yes, it does take a bit of time, but it makes me slow down and I really see all these buildings. I see their shape and how they're interconnected to each other. And then I will get the next map. So back to this page here. Moving on in time to the next map around the 1900s, this one. There we go. And that's going to show me how things have changed. So I, you can see not too much has changed but we do all of a sudden have this coming right the way through the middle axon joint railway so that's a lovely new thing to see coming right down once again there's the church there's the pub and not too much has changed but without doing my drawing i'm going to struggle to see that so what i would do is i'll take my tracing then i'll place it over this one and I can see really clearly what's changed. And maybe I'll take a different color pencil and color in the changes. And what you'll often see is where the footpaths echo ancient field boundaries. Or you'll see where the houses fit within a field or where they follow a road that perhaps isn't in use anymore you will see on later maps that this is now a footpath that goes through all the houses. And you'll see how that now follows, of course, the route of the railway. So you see how buildings and villages and settlements change and adapt as you go through time. And you see how that land management, how that is carried out. And it is interesting to see how where you live today, which sometimes looks so random, how that actually came about. So if you're looking at perhaps a group of standing buildings, then doing a map regression or a map progression, as it's called, when you look at the different ages of map and compare, is a really, really good exercise. I do recommend you do that just as an exercise for practice for yourself as well. OK, so once you have located your archaeological site or your artefact or your standing buildings that you wish to research further, you need to know where to go next. And this is where we're going to be exploring that factor. Now, I've got a few different uh, resources here. 
I tend to use the top two. I don't tend to use the bottom ones so much, but I have included them just in case they, um, they're more useful to you. Now, Google Scholar is a little device I actually found during my uni days and correctly used, it can be really, really useful. Now, of course, you have heard of Google Search, Google Images, Google Maps. There's actually a Google for a lot of different things. And Google Scholar searches um, journal articles, books for um, the keywords that you type in. So, for example, I'm going to type in Low Melwood Priory. That is that priory we looked at near Oston Ferry. Say I was researching that. So you can do a custom range in date. Say, for example, you want to find information that was no more than 10 years old. You could, in fact, uh, do that there. Um, now, this one hasn't come up with too many, um, too many results, actually. Uh, the further down we go, the more kind of off topic they get. But if we start at the top, you can see we've got two different, um, two different results here. And so the first one is all about Roman Catholic identity. So if I was examining Low Melwood Priory and how it sat within the Catholic Church, I would perhaps be more interested in this one. But personally, I'm interested in how Low Melwood Priory sat, sits within the Isle of Axo. So I'm going to click on this one. Now it tells me here I can buy the ebook for £3.73. Um, However, if I don't want to spend the money or it's too expensive, I can always pop into my local library and track it down in paper format. Now, you'll notice here there is a little search box and this can help you really locate what you're looking for. So I'm going to search for Low Melwood Priory. And at the top, it pops up with result one of two in this book. So maybe it's not going to be as useful as I thought, but I'm still going to have a look. So I'm being told that uh, my link is on this page somewhere. Now I have actually read this page already, so I know for a fact it's right at the bottom. Here we go. So it's telling me there were two sorts of priories. Firstly, where the prior was governor as fully as any abbot and was chosen by the convent. And secondly, when the prior was a cell subordinate to some great abbey and the prior was placed and displaced at the will of the abbot. So and it tells me Low Melwood belonged to the first of these two description priories. So we know that from that, I found out that Low Melwood had a prior who was a governor um, and was chosen by his convent. So this is probably a more powerful um, priory because it's not acting as a subordinate to an abbey. And that is something I can take from there. And you can see once again, that to me looks like a reference. So that is something else I could follow up on. And let's go back. Now of all these things, as usual with Google, you're going to get things that are not as, um, aren't as relevant. For example, archeological test pit, that sounds great. However, if we look closer, we'll see it was in Cambridgeshire and there was a local nature reserve called Melwoods. Of course, Google has picked up on the same name, but it's directing us towards a link that is not quite as useful. So you do still need to be a little bit careful um, when using it. And I have found um, Google Scholar to be really useful when searching for different sources. The other one that I've come across more recently since becoming an archaeologist is the Archaeology Data Service. Now, this is really a hidden gem of information. And I do think it's a shame that not more people know about it. This is basically a place where you can find a lot of different archaeological reports when a dig's been going on. And it may surprise you to know, but there are more archaeological digs happening in this country than you probably realise. Um, a lot of developments, say, for example, for a housing estate or a road, they have to complete an archaeological assessment before or during the works. And then any results that the archaeologists find are published online. And this is where you can start to find them. So, yeah, I'm going to type in Haxi this time and I'm going to search 
the first one and just see what comes up. Here we go. And oh, we've got plenty of results. So Axon Joint Railway, if you remember, we saw that in the map of Belton when we were looking at the National Library of Scotland map. So we're already making links between different sources. So if I wanted to find more about that, this would be a great place to look. And this is from Historic England. But I am going to show you this one here. Now, as I was saying, this is a report of someone completing an archaeological excavation in the parish of Haxey. So you can see it says archaeological evaluation report. It's called a grey literature report. And this basically means that this is very, very dense uh, and it is the standard report given um, after an excavation. Now, these can be a little bit dense to read, um, but don't let that put you off. So it will bring you to this link here and you can download the report. This is all completely free, by the way. So this was completed in 2006. So it's a few years old now. It tells you the archaeological company that completed it. The key, and this is actually I find more important than the results, is summary. This shows you the site location where the dig took place. The bit I think you are going to find really, really important for your research in an area is this section here. And every archaeological report has it. Archaeological and historic background. And this is when um, the archaeological team, they research the area beforehand to create a short background before they complete their dig. And this is published in the report. So if you have an area you want to find out about, this is a really good, concise way of finding out the um, relevant finds of note, sites of note in the area. Um, so if you're researching your village, just type in your village to ADS. Find an archaeological report from your village, can be anywhere in the village, and should have this archaeological and historic background. So from this, we know that field walking has taken place. Uh, they found flint, they found a Bronze Age date um, artifacts. They have found crop marks, socketed axes. There is evidence of Romano-British activity, that's Roman activity, um, but that's only from a coin found near West Woodside. There is no archaeological evidence of Anglo-Saxon activity. However, because it appears in the Doomsday Book, they do think there was something here. So this is basically someone's already done the work for you. So why repeat it? They've already brought together a lot of different information. And you'll notice, as I was saying earlier, there's a reference there. And let's see, there's another reference there. It is all referenced up. So we can continue going down if we want to find out more about these things. And there we are. References. So there's that Fenwick reference. There we are. Wetland heritage of the Ancombe and Lower Trent Valleys, an archaeological survey. So that could be another really good book for me to put on my list to look at at the library. And the other one I saw there was Morgan and Thorn Doomsday Book, Lincolnshire. So that clearly is going to tell me more about what's happening um, during the Doomsday Book. So once again, another really, really useful resource there that opens up a lot more resources as well. Some academic journals are available online digitally and uh, some of them might be useful to you. I've not found uh, many that have been focused on the Arvaxone, so that's perhaps less useful, but generally if you're looking to do documentary research, you might find an archaeological or historic society journal near you that focuses on your area. That could be very useful. And British History Online. There we go. This is a collection of a lot of those, remember those primary and secondary sources um, that relate to the uh, British Isles. I don't tend to use this one so much personally. They are. I don't recommend you uh, 
press that button really because that's going to come up with everything. You, of course, want to be using the keywords. So let's just type in Isle of Axone this time, see what pops up. Oh, there we go. House of Carthusian monks, Priory of Axone. So we're back to Low Melwood Priory. There we go, in Oston, Kinnard's Ferry. All those things we've been learning about today already. And you've got lots and lots of information there. So that is referencing a book, um, A History of the County of Lincoln, Volume 2. So another source for me to follow up on. And the last area that I really think is worth mentioning is local knowledge. Never underestimate what people already know, and you can save yourself a lot of time simply by reaching out. Now, Facebook can actually be used as a resource in this regard. Um, we do have some very specialist Facebook groups, people researching history of an area. So for example, this is quite an active group, Boston Memories, Lincolnshire, UK. Um, memory groups tend to be people sharing photographs, um, old photographs, old drawings, um, information about their town, and can be a great place to exchange research or even pose a question, see if anyone can help you. However, even if your town doesn't have a memory group, most towns, I think probably all of them now, and villages have their own community group. So have a look at your um, community group pose a question in there, it might well be able to be that you can link up with someone who will know the answer. Um, the other one to look at is local archaeology groups. Um, they are scattered around and about, um, but local archaeology, local history, local interest groups are collections of people who are already researching what you're researching. And they are going to be, I am going to bet, happy to um, share their information with you and also happy to find out what you've discovered as well. So please do, um, do try reaching out to people as well. So that's kind of as far as you can go online. Um, like I said, through this, I've almost been making a list of saying, oh, I could find that book in the library, I could find that book in the library. And when we had a look at links to the past, it was giving us a list of things we could find at Lincolnshire Archives. Now, I do just quickly want to mention Lincolnshire Archives. It's not as scary as it might sound. Um, it is located in the middle of Lincoln, opposite the library. And it's almost like visiting the library. There's just a few more rules in place. So what I would recommend is look up information regarding the new restrictions because of COVID, because of the uh, coronavirus before you visit, because what I tell you now might well be different by the time you listen to this. Booking in advance is required, but this is fairly easy to do. If you want to find information about the archives, just click on this link here. So that's Lincolnshire Archives. There you are, and it tells you all about it. So it tells you, for example, the current COVID advice with bookings and time slots. And it can tell you about what you can find there. Now, it does work a little bit differently. You cannot take documents home with you. Um, however, the staff there will happily show you how to use what's going on. What happens is you tend to sit down, give the staff a list of what you're after, and they will bring up the documents you're after from the records and you'll be able to study them at your leisure. And it is amazing what records you can have a look at. So um, the breadth of things and um, the stories you can uncover is really fascinating. So it is worth a look. When you turn up on your first day, you'll just need to um, sign a, a document or two and you'll get your card printed. And it is as easy as that. Um, a fantastic resource and one I wish people, people use more, really. There you are. And this is the kind of things you can find. So when I was having a look at Isle of Axome, I found enclosure maps. This is when, of course, the land was being enclosed into fields and the commons were being destroyed. Um, I found out information about Axome Joint Railway from the, oops, 
from the Belt and Tithe Assessment that gave me information and from a document called the Lost Railways of Lincolnshire. I found the Axon Tithe Act in full and of course that's people paying their taxes. So I've got information about names, dates, occupations, which is all fantastic, really personal information. And I also found maps such as the Axon Wetlands maps. So the amount of information you find there is almost limitless. However, one of the most important things when it comes to documentary research is to practice, practice, practice. You are not going to get this right first time and someone who has been doing documentary research for the whole of their life will not be getting it right um, all the time either. This is a treasure hunt. You are looking for information and you are going to be looking in all these different places and sometimes you'll find it straight away. It might take you years to find another piece of information. The main thing is to keep going at it. The other warning I would give you is it is addictive. So you can start off with one question, but as ever with archeology span and heritage research, the more you find out, the more questions you have because you want to find out more. And so once you start going down that rabbit hole, you can keep going and going and going. The amount of stories and scandals and information and general narrative to the location and artifacts that surround you is fascinating. So if you choose to go down the rabbit hole of documentary research, I know you're going to have a great time and enjoy the ride. And so that brings us to the end of our documentary research digital course. Now I had thrown a lot of information at you, so feel free to listen to this again, perhaps a bit slower. Um, but I do recommend you go and have a look at all these different sites, start playing around with them. Just research where you live or where you grew up and see what jumps out at you, see what grabs your interest. Now, of course, at this point, I do want to thank a few people. Um, the Isle of Axe Home and Hatfield Chase Landscape Partnership, of course, who commissioned this work and North Lincolnshire Council who organised this whole project. And of course, for every one of you out there who has brought a lottery ticket, you have helped fund this work because the National Lottery Heritage Fund has given the money for it to be carried out. If you do want to find out anything more about Heritage Lincolnshire, please do look us up online. We've got plenty going on and plenty of information should you want to find out more about us. And of course, there are more digital courses online on the Isle of Axe and Hatfield Chase Landscape Partnership website, should you wish to find out more and experience more of these courses. But for now, I'd like to say thank you so much for listening and so much for sticking with me and good luck on your documentary research. Thank you very much. <laughs>